Good morning, people of God. It is good to see you as we gather together today uh, for World Communion Sunday, this first Sunday of October. Um, As we gather, I did want to uh, lift up a couple things. Uh, First, I'm going to call on Margaret Cornell, who's going to speak to uh, the the United Women in Faith, who are right now in the midst of a pecan sale, but she's going to speak to the ministry and mission that's benefited. Yeah. So if you will, go ahead, turn on her mic. Good morning. So is it pecans or pecans? <laughs> pecans, pecans. It doesn't matter how you say it. We know it is a delicious nut. So appropriate for sprinkling on um, hot waffles with maple syrup or making those delicious pecan pies. You know it is a delicious nut. Now, the United Women of Faith, formerly known as the United Methodist Women, is having a pecan sale out in the Welcome Center. The pecans are now being, uh, orders are being taken for the pecans, which come from Georgia. Now, why are we having this sale? All proceeds go to the Redbird Mission in Beverly, Kentucky. Beverly, Kentucky is in the rugged, mountainous area of Appalachia, where one finds chronic poverty, many lack, lack of jobs, and poor housing. And you also will remember that this was the area where the flooding was held, much flooding uh, in July. So, and Redbird was affected. For over 30 years, the United Methodist Women, now known as United Women of Faith, has supported this worthy mission. Every penny will go toward that mission. So, is it pecans or pecans? It doesn't matter, just go and put your order in after the service right there with Carolyn Gunter. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Grateful for the ways that we can support ministry together. Uh, I did want to lift up, as we gather, a couple other uh, invitations. One of those is is two Sundays from today, October the 16th. Um, Here in the sanctuary at 9.30 a.m., we'll still have our kind of 9.15, 9 to 9.00, Really, we're going to do 9 to 9.30 will be coffee, some donuts. But at 9.30 on the 16th, we're going to have an intergenerational event that we're calling Songs of Faith. And so we have a team of people who, have, uh, who are receiving these wonderful little cards. We want your feedback on what is your favorite hymn or church song. Where can we find it? So even if it's in the most obscure book, let us know where it's at. And then why is that meaningful to you? Um, And we're asking that because one of the things we realized was that we wanted to find opportunities throughout the school year where children, young people, and adults can gather together. That is called intergenerational uh, or multi-generational. And one of the gifts that we found this summer in the hymn sing was that this congregation loves to sing. And so we wanted our children to be a part of that celebration. And so that is coming up in two weeks. Uh, we went around today in our Sunday school classes and asked them to share what, was your, what is your favorite hymn or church song. Now, there are some of these out on the table just in the Welcome Center. So if you'd like to fill one out, you can grab one. And if for some reason that stack is gone when you get there today, just see me and I will give you another or we'll find something for you to write it on. We want your feedback. Um, the team that will be leading that um, is Rachel Ward, who is not hiding, but is down in the organ loft. Uh, Mark Hagwood is helping with that, as well as Diane Winkler and Jeff Shear. And so that team would love to hear your feedback. So as we kind of choose the songs we'll sing across the ages, uh, we'll get a chance to connect to the different songs of faith that are important to this congregation. Um, So again, fill that out. Let us know. It's good feedback for us to know. Those are in the Welcome Center on the table right as soon as you walk out. There are two tables next to one another, and you'll see small stacks of these for you to fill out. Uh, I know as we come together today, many of you have your hearts and minds still focused on how is Debbie doing? 
Um, unfortunately, we're a week later, and what I can say is this. She is no longer in the neuro ICU. She's moved to a regular room and is looking to move to rehab this next week, um, inpatient rehab. Um, they've answered some questions, um, but they don't have answers to all the questions. So while they're able to address one aspect, like the small seizure she had, they have not answered a lot of the other pieces. So continue to lift her in your prayers. Uh, I don't have a lot more than that to update right now, unfortunately. Um, but I know that you care about her, so please keep sending cards and the reminder that you love and care for her. I know we've also been mindful as the, as the fellowship class gathered this morning uh, to remember uh, Wayne Plump, who had to have uh, brain surgery this last week, um, who is doing well, thankfully, but it's going to be a slow process of recovery for him. Um, but prayers for him as he continues to navigate that healing process and for Jenny and Holly and Carrie who walk alongside them. Um, also, as we've gathered, uh, we have a number of retired clergy within our midst. Um, and I, it's a gift to me that we have so many. Jim Edwards is often one that you see right up here in the choir loft singing. His wife, Ruby, went home on hospice care a couple weeks ago, and so he is caring for her right now. Um, but lift up them in your prayers as we gather. There are likely many others that we could lift up today um, that are going through health questions, that are not feeling great, that are having great celebrations. The myriad of emotions and feelings that we share together is the gift of the community of faith, that we walk the journey together. Amen? And a phone call, a card, uh, a meal where appropriate are all ways that we extend Christ's love to those that come alongside us. Um, and so I just want to give thanks for the ways that you're doing that and continue to nudge you on to more of that as we look ahead in the coming days and weeks there's likely concerns that I don't even know as I'm standing here this morning. Um, I don't know the names of every person for whom uh, Florida or South Carolina or Puerto Rico who are, are facing the overwhelming destruction that has been natural disasters. Uh, for the disruption that's happened in places like Indonesia where so many have been impacted by the stampede and the chaos there in a, in a sporting event. The list of things we should lift in prayer are long. And the places where our hearts might be directed, depending on what we see in the news or in our newspaper, can certainly feel like it's just a lot. But this I am grateful for, that the God to whom we pray is present in every one of those places. And sometimes invites us to be an extension of that love in those places as well. So today I give thanks for the the ministry of the United Methodist Church gathered around the globe um, that is worshiping together today. Some are putting on their mud boots and getting to work. Others are reaching out with food insecurity. Others in places torn by war are saying, this is going to be a place of peace. And I'm grateful to be a part of a church that does that work. Amen. And so today as we gather and as we are mindful of God's presence, we light the candle to not only remind us, but to give witness to the light of Christ that moves throughout our world. Let us worship God together.
Good morning. Please come, please join me in the call to worship. And your response is, thanks be to God for the word. The word has come from, for us from God, who promises to shelter us under the wings of hope and grace. Thanks be to God for the word. The word has come to us from Jesus, who encourages us to remember the good news we have received. Thanks be to God for the word. The word flows to us from the Spirit, who reminds us to place our hope and trust in God. Thanks be to God for the word. Would you stand as you are able in body or spirit for our opening hymn of praise, God Hath Spoken by the Prophets. You can find the words on the screen or in your hymnal number 108. We'll sing stanzas one and three. invite you to remain standing uh, in body or spirit as we hear today from the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke chapter 16 beginning in verse 19. There was a certain rich man who clothed himself in purple and fine linen and who feasted luxuriously every day. At his gate lay a certain poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores Lazarus longed to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Instead, dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. While being tormented in the place of the dead, he looked up and saw Abraham at a distance with Lazarus at his side. He shouted, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I'm suffering in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, whereas Lazarus received terrible things. Now Lazarus is being comforted and you are in great pain. Moreover, a great crevice has been fixed between us and you. Those who wish to cross over from here to you cannot. Neither can anyone cross from there to us. The rich man said, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. He needs to warn them so they don't come to this place of agony. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They must listen to them. 
The rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will change their heart and lives. Abraham said, If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated, and I'll invite our children to come forward to share some time with me here at the altar. Come on down. Good morning, good morning. Hi, good morning. You want to come sit up here? Let's come sit up here. Come on up. Good morning. It's Pastor Brian and the Beckers. How we doing? Are we good? Can I, can I give you a high five? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Hey, can I share a story with you? You like that? You shared a story with me this morning because you brought a couple books to church. Um, what book did you bring to church? Can you tell me? There's a monster in this book. That's one of my favorite books from when I was a kid. Uh, and I brought a toy book. You brought the toy book that Amazon so graciously sent to your mom and dad. Mm-hmm. Come on up, Ben. Because you brought some books to church today too, didn't you? You're shaking your head no. That bag looked awful heavy. Was there some books inside of it? Not reading books. Not reading books. Okay, okay. What about you, Jacob? Do you have a favorite book? No. Nope. Okay. Well, can I share a book with you this morning? This is called Children of God, Storybook Bible by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. This is one of my favorite children's Bibles. Uh, my favorite too. Your favorite too? Wonderful. We read this to Charlotte when she was little bitty, and we continue to pull it off the shelf and read it regularly. Um, sorry Charlotte's not able to be here. She's not feeling great today. So. But in this book, can you tell me what you see in this picture? What do you see, Ben? The disciples with Jesus. And what does it look like they're doing? Go for it, Ben. Having communion. Having communion. They're eating a meal together, right? This is one of Jesus' last meals, and this artist drew them all sitting around a table with food. And in the midst of that meal, Jesus did something. He took some bread from the table and a cup from the table, and he said, this is me giving my life for you. And we do that, too. We come together at a table as well. Can you tell me where the table is in our sanctuary? Um, where is it? Um, it's in our kitchen. It's you have a table in your kitchen. I appreciate that. Yes? Where do we see a table in this room? Can you look around? Let's look around. Do we see any tables? Maybe turn around. Is there a table behind us? Yeah, right there. Why don't we go up here? Come on, let's walk up and look at it. This is our table, our communion table. And what are some things that we see on it? Can you tell me? A cup. A cup. This is called a chalice. Hand sanitizer because we're all about cleanliness. Yes. What else, Ben? Yes, bread and juice here. And here, look what's inside of this pitcher. Can you tell me? What do you see in there? What is it? You're looking really close. It's grape juice. That's right. We use that. And there's here. And then what is this? Um, bread. It's bread. Yes, we, we use these symbols to remind us of God's love that comes to us in Jesus. And every time we gather at this table, that's what we're doing. Much like the disciples, we're hearing about God's love. So can we pause right here and just pray and say, thank you, God, for signs of your love? Let's do that. Let's put our hands together. All right. Loving and gracious God, we give thanks for signs of your love that you offer to us, sometimes with bread and juice, other times with water and the gift of the earth around us and for the food we receive. Thank you for so many signs of your love. We pray in Jesus' name as we pray your blessing upon these children. Amen. Thanks so much. Our hymn of preparation, as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear uh, the word brought to us through the sermon, is When We Are Living. It can be found on the hymnal, uh, page 356. We'll sing stanza one before the sermon, stanza four after. You can also find the words on the screen. You may remain seated as we sing together. (laughs) 
When we are living, it is in Christ Jesus. And when we're dying, it is in the Lord. Both in our living and in our dying, we belong to God. We belong to God. I invite you to join me in prayer as we gather together this day. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God who meets us in the midst of not only our need, but in the midst of our lack of understanding our need. We thank you for your grace that is more than sufficient, not just for us, but for all. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be a gift unto your sight as we seek to not only know you, but to trust you more fully. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, what a joy today's text is. I know you're excited. <clears throat> it's one of those stories that we find in the Gospel of Luke that we say, what was Jesus up to? He probably said some stories like this on a regular basis, right? If we've read our Scripture we recognize this isn't the only time Jesus said something that the hearers maybe weren't thrilled about hearing. Amen? Let those who have ears listen. We regularly are invited when we come to the Scriptures. Today's story is a little bit challenging in part because it's easy for us to make a leap or a jump when we hear this story, to think, okay, here is an example of heaven and hell, but I want to pause and offer caution, that's not what Jesus was often pointing to. In fact, he spent a lot less time talking about heaven and hell than we'd like to acknowledge, though we get really fascinated with our conversations of such. That was not his focus in our story today. In fact, if you look in the larger picture of Luke, he's been telling stories like this for a little bit. We've looked at two of those in the last couple of weeks. Right? Rewind two weeks ago, and you have the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin followed by the prodigal story that we often lift up, or the story of the father with two sons. Among the most familiar parables in the Scripture are those. The next one that we looked at last week was that of the dishonest manager who squanders his owner's, the master's wealth, uh, in a way of creating friends for himself when he's removed from his position. Right? The story just before that that we mentioned just a moment ago of the father and the two sons, the prodigal squanders his father's wealth as well. But in our story today, we meet this character, the rich man. He's not named. He's not named, but we realize that he lives very luxuriously throughout his life. And outside of his gate is a poor man who is named Lazarus. Lazarus has lived outside of this rich man's gate but the rich man has not taken time to make note of his need, or at least not address it. He knows him by name, by Lazarus. He's just done nothing to change his plight or to assist him. In our story, it says that, that the dogs have come to meet Lazarus there. They even lick his wounds. There's an irony there that the dogs, which would be akin to a rat in our society, they're seen with that kind of disdain showed more compassion than the rich man. The animal nobody wanted around showed more compassion than the rich man. Now, there's a wonderful uh, irony that comes in our story. We might want to hear it very quickly as Jesus condemning him, but let's listen and maybe with a little kindness and also with a little humor. In the book, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, the author Bailey lifts up that the word for the rich man, he's clothed in purple, which we think of as royalty, and fine linen. And this is what he says. The word here is busos in Greek, which transliterates into butts in Hebrew, which literally meant, is a term used to describe quality Egyptian underwear. So he is clothed in royal robes and soft underpants. 
There's an irony here of how much he longed for comfort with an ignorance to how he was squandering his life. Wealth did not show him at all what it meant to truly live. And only in this afterlife occasion, in this moment when he finds he's in great need, does he find that he maybe didn't live the way. But, but sadly, our story doesn't give us that part yet. In fact, all we hear of the rich man is that he now cannot see Lazarus or himself in any different situation. Pay attention to the story as we look at it a little more closely. It says that, that the rich man shouts, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. This is verse 24. Send Lazarus to dip the tongue, tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I'm suffering. The rich man still can't see Lazarus as more than a servant. He is unable to see that things have changed. There's this great chasm between us, um, or this gulf, depending on your translation, it will use different images. Yet here's the irony, and maybe the irony we need to pay most close attention to. Lazarus keeps himself from being able to cross it with his own way of thinking. His own way of thinking has been the very barrier that has kept him from acknowledging his need. And even when he points to it, he says, send Lazarus not only to cool my tongue, but then his next request is send him to warn my brothers. I have five of them. If somebody comes back from the dead, surely they'll listen. A kind of pointing to this Jesus that we celebrate, who would return from the dead, but did the people listen? No. In fact, the, here in this parable Jesus tells, when He says they have Moses and the prophets, they've been hearing of God's good news all this time. They've had plenty of opportunity and yet have not heard it. They've squandered their lives. This is a challenging story. Not just for us to hear because it's Hard for us to imagine maybe what character we might place ourselves in. Certainly none would say, I feel like I'm Lazarus, or would be very reticent to claim that. None of us want to be considered the rich man who is so blind to the needs of others. Maybe we're more like the rich man's brothers. We still have opportunity to hear more clearly, to allow the Spirit of God to dwell in our hearts and minds and transform us, so that the gulf that sometimes is created in the world in which we live in could be closed. That we wouldn't restrict ourselves from God's transforming grace. You see, the rich man found he put more desire in his own comforts, maybe even in himself, more than upon God. If he feasted every day luxuriously, that meant that while he might have been and he claims Abraham as his father, a person of faith. He didn't practice it with any regularity because Sabbath would have required some fasting and pause. But he continued feasting. You see, the challenge of our story is when we try to pick a character, we almost want to just stand outside of the story altogether, looking in, thinking, none of these fit me. And maybe they don't perfectly. But stories like this are in the Scripture because they nudge us to pay attention. Who might be the Lazarus in the midst of our community? Lord knows that not only in the day in which Jesus is speaking these words, but in our own day, those who are experiencing poverty in any form or fashion sometimes receive the greatest of ridicule and judgment by the larger world around them. And yes, even I fall into the trap. If they just did this or that, we might offer in a conversation with a friend, then they wouldn't be in this situation as though it's a one-two step to move out of poverty. Reality is, that's not the journey at all. You see, one of the challenges that I'm struggling most with as I think about the church is the irony of the first part of this story. The rich man calls Abraham his father but if that's the case, then he's also Lazarus' father, which makes the rich man and Lazarus brothers. But the rich man can't see that. 
Sometimes I fear that, that not just the world, but the church sometimes struggles to see the common humanity we have with those who maybe don't think like us, look like us, or even act like us. And so stories like this call into question how easily we separate and divide ourselves. Sadly, uh, King's concern for the church, Martin Luther King Jr.'s concern for the church to be that 11 o'clock hour is the most segregated hour in American history continues to be the case. Even on this World Communion Sunday, when our communion offering will benefit racial and ethnic scholarships throughout the United Methodist Church, there is still a great divide and disconnect between our shared life and experience together. Last Sunday, I had a chance to meet um, Reverend Wanyama, who came to us from Wesley College. And so I spoke with he and uh, Eric Sword, our missionary, after they had the event where they shared some of the kind of challenges and opportunities for the United Methodist Church in Africa. He said a lot about context. And suddenly I found myself sitting back in the classroom of seminary realizing that that's what they were regularly telling us. He reminded those who were listening that, that Africa is not one, is not a one size fits all, that it's 54 countries that make up the continent of Africa with numerous languages and traditions. And the invitation and the challenge that he found himself offering was that they needed to empower their students to address the unique contexts where they would be sent so that the church would give meaning and language. He hesitated and he paused a few times in our conversation because I'm sure he recognized the tension as Wesley College is, it does receive a great deal of funding from the United States of how oftentimes the United States continues to impact their work, not always positively. Because unfortunately, the tendency of colonialism runs deep in our story and in our way of approaching the world. But he pressed to continue to say that we must equip leaders to give witness to the space and the communities, the villages where they are, to translate these stories with meaning. It was a powerful invitation. But it made me wonder, what would that look, for us, what would that look like for us here in Bellevue and West Nashville? How might we walk alongside one another? Would we too easily condemn our neighbor that we don't know as the rich man without recognizing that Jesus was speaking to religious folks. He was speaking to us. And I'll be the first to confess that the one he was maybe speaking most loudly to would be the religious leaders like myself. The Sadducees and the Pharisees that we often like to toss into the wind when we read the stories of the Scripture were the ones that he was most speaking to in these moments, inviting them to have a widened perspective. So maybe in our reading of this today and my offering it to you, I'm simply inviting you to join me in trying to have more intentional eyes to see and ears to hear. In this story is a story for each of us. In the book, The Hardest Question, the author tells a story of a rare occasion when he called, he said he made a, quote, heroic effort to look at the begging person in the eye and recognize them as a child of God that they were. It said this, he, he reflects on the story this way. He said, a friend of mine recently told me about an experience he had. After the gathering of his faith community, he walked outside to find a man begging for spare change. And he asked, what do you need the money for? The man replied, I'd like to buy a beer. Sorry, my friend said, I can't give you money for that. Then my friend went on to a pub down the street with his church friends and bought a round of beers for everyone. He said, reflecting on this incident, he said, I guess I felt justified judging the begging man, assuming he was an alcoholic, even though I would never do that to my friends. Today's story invites us to have a little more intentional eyes. Do we believe that we see more than we do? Do we fall into the trap 
of being so focused on our own need that we sometimes miss the common shared humanity that we're invited to offer to those we walk alongside. It's been a challenging work for us as we have navigated the last year. That's right, at the end of this month, we will have housed the Mobile Housing Navigation Center for one entire year. Some have joined us for worship on occasion. Many, though, continue to find the shadows the place that they must move about in our larger community. I shared with you just a a brief snapshot of my experience last week, or the week before last, with the mayor here for a press conference to point to the $50 million ask that goes to the council this week on housing in Nashville, that they must approve four resolutions for that to happen. It was a mixture of emotions for me because I don't necessarily spend a lot of time with our mayor or council persons, though they were in our parking lot. I also don't necessarily spend a lot of time with neighbors that I wouldn't cross paths with, weren't it not for their uh, advocacy and their sometimes protesting what's happening at the Brookmead Park. I got to meet members of Reclaim Brookmead, including the organizer, Rebecca Lowe, in our parking lot. In each of these conversations, I felt myself almost wanting to be a bystander just looking in. But I realized they were asking, what does it mean for the church to be in the midst of this? And I tried to give witness to the stories I knew of the persons who had been through the program. It wasn't without questions. I'm not going to say to you today that the four resolutions that will be passed will at all answer homelessness in Nashville. I don't believe that to be the case. No matter how many promises our mayor and council persons might lift up, no solution will be found without long-term investment. Short-term money, which is what this is, will not answer that. I also don't believe that the mayor and our council people are uniquely responsible for addressing homelessness on their own. Church, we have a responsibility in that too. And if we are not willing to do our part, then that that ongoing problem will remain. That ongoing crisis for some of our neighbors will continue. If we walk by our own city and, and neighborhood gates, ignoring the names and the stories and the challenges, how are we much different than the rich man? That said, just knowing their stories doesn't do anything if we've allowed for only the dogs that worm them about to be the ones that care. I'm not saying this is easy work. In fact, the last year has taught me this work is really hard. It means showing up and holding space in in the most honest way I know how, which is through listening more than speaking, which might surprise you is harder for the preacher than you realize. That you have to hold space and listen to the story of your neighbor. That I cannot move too quickly to judgment of what I think they need to do. Because if I'm going to empower them, give them the power to really make a difference, they have to decide that for themselves. In conversation with a neighbor last week, a comment was made, maybe we should take away some of their ability to choose, we should just press people to be moved out of the camp to another place. And I said, you can't take away a person's agency And she said, what agency are you referring to? And I said, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. You can't take away a person's autonomy and expect that they will become different. God has given each of us power and freedom. We say that in our baptismal vows. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression? And we say yes when we come to be baptized or when we baptize another. We cannot take away the autonomy of a person and expect that their life will be transformed. As much as I'd love to lift up the rich man's faults, I more am concerned about his lack of awareness of his own need to be transformed. Of his own need to recognize how he had ability and opportunity but squandered it. And then I realize I'm too quickly looking in the mirror at how much I can miss the opportunity to be a sign of grace 
to become more aware of my own need for transformation and maybe move across the gulf that I've created for myself with my neighbor, no matter their background, of socioeconomics, of race, of sexuality, whatever the list might be that my world, the world around me tells me are completely justified, if I've not called those into question, maybe I don't realize the gulf I've created. But thanks be to God, this story doesn't end with this parable alone, but always with an invitation by Jesus to have your eyes opened, to have your hearts and minds transformed. God is not done with us yet. Amen? So may God grace meet us this day as we go about that work of transformation in our own hearts and minds, both individually and as a community of faith. Thanks be to God. Amen. Four of when we are living, you may remain seated as we sing together. Across this wide world, we shall always find. As we pray this morning, we remember the concerns that Brian lifted at the beginning, the Tyree family, the Plump family, the Edwards family, the people in Florida and South Carolina and Indonesia, and those people right at our city gates who we need to open our eyes to. Let's take a moment of silence before we pray together. When we fall into the traps of groundless fears, you deliver us. When an epidemic of worry threatens to overcome us, you protect us. When harmful words are flung at us, you answer our cries for help. Gracious God, we worship you. When our lives crumble, you urge us to buy hope's fields. When we are tempted by wealth, you point us to those who have nothing but share everything. When we are eager to grasp senseless lies, you wrap our hands around your promises. Servant of the poor, we follow you. When the world silences our hope, you give us the words to make the good confession of faith. When we have lost our way and can no longer endure the emptiness of our lives, you satisfy us from the abundance of your grace and joy. Sheltering spirit, we seek your peace. God in community, holy in one, our refuge, our trust, our hope, we lift our prayer to you. Amen. Hear the invitation to the table. Christ our Lord invited to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. We need to confess, God of Abraham and Lazarus, how often we are not content with the simple gifts and lives you offer. Tempted by everything, we can become insensitive to those who have nothing. Encouraged by the world to accumulate more, we may miss the chance to gather your goodness and godliness. Chasing after all which has no value, 
we may not have the energy to pursue the faith, the love, the gentleness you have for us. Forgive us, God of reversals. You have sent the one who speaks the words we need to listen to in order to have life. Help us to remember how you have redeemed us. And in remembering, may we make that good confession that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior now and forever. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The gift is when we hear words of forgiveness, they remind us that God constantly seeks for not only our transformation, but our reconciliation, our being made new. One of the gifts that we support in partnership that I may not always remember to lift up and celebrate is that between my office and Allison's is the Nurtured Soul Counseling Center. There are three clinicians who work with that practice who see a number of persons throughout the week that enter our building seeking hope and reconciliation, renewal in their life. It's a gift that we said yes to a few years ago trying to create that space, but one of the aspects that I maybe don't lift up is that that's available to you as well should you ever need a place to come and safely speak and to offer and, need, and be offered words of hope and encouragement. Um, one of the best gifts of that partnership that we lifted up was that not only would they pay a certain portion to help offset the cost of the space, but 60% of what they give goes to a counseling assistance fund to make available counseling to anybody who might not have access because they can't afford it out of their own pocket. That was a commitment we made on day one when we modeled it after the counseling center at Bell Mead United Methodist. But also to those of you who are members of this church, your first session is offered to you at no cost to you should you just want to see if you need that space. We all need it, okay? I need you to hear that. We all need it. It's one of the most prized hours I block out of my calendar every month is to make sure I sit down and process the journey of my own life with another. Um, but if you've never thought about that, I just want to lift up today that part of what we do as a church is create space like that, okay? And that gives me hope, and I'm thankful for it today. Uh, for Mary Ann Green, who is the uh, chief counselor and clinician that put together that practice um, but also for Allie and Cara, who come alongside her now as registered dietitians and clinicians who can offer that. Today, I'm grateful for the gifts like that that help support ministry connections and partnerships within our building for the sake of our community. And so with that said, let us give thanks to God as we pause now and receive this offertory.
God of justice and mercy, we come to worship you this day as ones who, on the great balance scale of your creation, are more like the rich man in the gospel story than we are Lazarus. As we offer gifts today, may we do so striving to be those blessed to be a blessing. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we gather for the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In your presence, life-shaping God, your heart besieged chaos, planting hope and joy where there was only despair, bringing forth fields of flowers where there was only emptiness. You created us in your image, singing and signing the deed for all creation, and sealing it for us, the Word and Spirit, The Spirit witnesses to your generosity. But we sought shelter in sin, choosing to live in the shadow of death. You called us through the prophets, but we did not answer. Determined to rescue us, you sent Jesus to us, bringing hope and grace and mercy to us once again. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. And if you will say these words with me today, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. King of kings, Jesus humbled himself as our servant, bringing everything we need into our world. Lord of lords, he set aside eternal glory with you to take on our fleeting life. Brother to the poor, he turned from riches of heaven to author the wealth of your mercy to all. Bearer of your good news, he bore witness to Pilate and all who rejected him of your grace which is stronger than death. Your love which defeats evil, your redemption that gives us new life. And so in your remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves our very lives in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for, for us as we proclaim together the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Here in the shelter of your grace, surrounded by the gifts of bread and cup. Here in the shadow of your love, which stretches through all creation and touches your children everywhere, we pray that you would pour out your spirit of peace, of hope, of joy. As we are strengthened by life shared with us by the broken one, we would go forth to live out our faith, satisfying the hunger of the world for reconciliation and for freedom. As we take hold of the cup of life, Will we not fear the terrors that besiege us, but journey on in trust and obedience, pursuing righteousness and justice for all? And when all life has ended, and your word calls to us, at that time we will gather with our sisters and brothers around the table of wonder and mercy you have prepared, forever singing our praises to you. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen, amen, amen. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray as Jesus taught us, saying together, 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The bread of heaven. The cup of salvation. As we gather this day to receive uh, these signs of God's love and grace, as I said to our children, uh, I want to offer just a few quick instructions to help you in that. The first of those is that we are still using the prepackaged um, elements, so you'll receive it with the bread up towards you. Uh, you'll pull that and receive it, then you can flip it and the juice is just below it. If you need some assistance opening this, please just look to Sheila. She will be up here to assist along as you come, if you'll just look to her, she can assist you. Um, as you come today, um, the ushers are going to release pew by pew to allow folks to have time to pray. Um, so don't feel rushed. If you need a moment to pray a little longer, do that. They'll kind of invite row by row as opportunity. Our communion offering today uh, in the bulletin says, Pastor's Discretionary Fund, that was an oversight on my part. It's actually World Communion Sunday. And so today, the offerings that are placed here join with United Methodist Churches throughout the world to support racial and ethnic scholarships. Um, and, and as folks go forth to receive and, and pursue their educational goals, last year, 50% of that offering provided scholarships for graduate students from the U.S. and other countries. 35% supported ethnic scholarships for undergraduate students. And then 15% went to fund, to fund in-service training programs for racial and ethnic persons. It was over $437,000 that were collected last year to help among the United Methodist Church. And so your gifts help that work. Um, and I know, uh, even as I'm up here leading, um, that a number of years ago when Jonathan was in school, received some of the gifts of that. Jonathan Tyree, one of our students here. And so I'm grateful for the ways that we support education around the world. So know that your second mile gift today on the communion offering will go to that. I'm going to now invite those who are helping uh, serve communion to come and receive the gifts of God's grace in this moment. Is set. I did want to offer this reminder that if you need to be served in your seat, please let our ushers know and we'll come to you. Uh, that way the table can be extended to you. For those who are receiving uh, the gifts of bread at home, uh, some have chosen to worship from home and do that. May the, the body and blood of Christ be with you as well as you receive those gifts. So let us now gather at the table of our Lord to receive these gifts this day.
invite you to join me in our prayer of thanks that's printed in your bulletin. Let us pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Sending forth this morning is number 427, Where Cross the Crowded Ways of Life. Let us sing stanza six together. Please rise as you are able. As we go forth this day, may you hear this word of good news that constantly Christ said throughout the scriptures and that we, I hope, the church continue to live out in our proclamation of hope. There is grace. There is hope. We are not alone. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God meet you this day to remind you that you are not alone in this journey. And may you sense that grace calling you to come forward, to be transformed by love and grace. Go forth now to love God and neighbor this week. 
And may you see signs of that in the interactions and relationships that happen in your life this week. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.